Good evening, everyone. Uh, I understand the lecture will be in English. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, good evening. Um, it's my pleasure to um, welcome Sam Schmidt from the um, European University Institute. European University Institute in Florence. Uh, today he's a visiting um, fellow at our department for uh, June 2018. So he will be here for another two to three weeks. So if you have like more comprehensive questions, feel free to contact him and uh, probably you'll find time for, for another discussion. Mm -hmm. Um, Sam is a political scientist, educated from the University of Luzern, mm -hmm. um, and since 2015, if I'm not mistaken, yes. yeah, a PhD student at the European University Institute in Florence, uh, supervised by Werner Baubeck and, mm -hmm. and Martin Bink. Uh, he published quite a lot on citizenship, um, immigration, electoral inclusion of immigrants, and he did that with a strong focus on comparative policy analysis. So he's really the expert on um, comparative data sets on citizenship policies, immigration policies, and so on. So if you have any questions regarding these issues, which can often be quite complicated, uh, he's the one to ask, he's the one to consult. Um, in his PhD project, which is labeled uh, Walls and Passports, uh, he focuses on the relationship between citizenship policies and immigration policies. He will talk about that in, in detail in the presentation, which is part of the PhD project right. um, for which he is conducting research, field research in Austria at the moment. Um, well, the presentation will be held in English, but uh, don't worry, we can have the discussion in German as well as in English, that's, that's no problem at all. I understand we are all German-speaking people. I'm Swiss German speaking. Yes, Swiss German. So we probably don't understand you, but I'll um, <laughs> discussion of it. Um, please be aware that there's a video in the back here, in the back. So um, if you stay here, you consent that uh, you might appear to give you at some point if you ask a question as well. If you don't want to be uh, seen at the video, if you stay on this side of the room, so you don't see uh, we can't see you at the. Well, uh, thanks for coming to us, for speaking to us this evening, and give the floor to you. And I think we, we understood that the presentation will be about 40 minutes. Right, yeah. right. And we have a lot of time for, for the discussion. I have to set the timer. Okay. Well, Jeremias, thank you so much for his warm welcome. It's a pleasure to be here. And first of all, I want to thank uh, not only Jeremias, but the whole political science department here, and especially Sieglinde de Rosenberger, for hosting me for one month uh, to conduct my field work here in Austria for my PhD. It's really a great environment to be here, good infrastructure and great contacts and expertise in different areas that, that I can really profit from. Especially this is my first case study, and it's really good that everything is so accessible and people are so ready to help me and uh, I even live in a place where uh, uh, my host is uh, an asylum lawyer and his girlfriend is actually the one that uh, now I have her office uh, from and I live at that place and she's also working on migration and asylum. There's books on migration and asylum at home on Austria so I'm reading and I'm talking all the time. It's basically a permanent interview. Um, <laughs> Thanks for everyone for coming. Uh, I hope that um, I have something to say that will make you happy about your decision to come here. Uh, and also thanks to Wolfgang for taping the session. Um, now to give you a little bit of background on my PhD project, uh, Jeremias has already said some, uh, some elements. So my question is how are immigration policies or the openness of immigration policies related to the inclusiveness of citizenship policies. Under what conditions is there a trade-off? How are they related? How do they condition each other? These kind of things. You, can, you see you can formulate it in many different ways, which means different analytical lenses and so on, something I struggle with. But what I'm going to talk about today is the descriptive part of my thesis. And descriptive by no means means uh, that I just 
list variables and numbers and everything. I tried to make an, uh, an analytical argument, and of course we know uh, a descriptive analysis, a good careful descriptive analysis is the basis for a good causal analysis as well. So that's what I aim to do here. Try to form my concept, uh, try to see the measurements, uh, de de determine the measurements, map the variables, map the variations so I can go to the next step. And at the same time, not make it too boring as a mere mapping exercise. That's why I've titled it Resolving the Paradox of the Liberal Paradox. The Liberal Paradox is a very dominant, influential idea in migration studies. I'll explain to you in a minute uh, what it is and also why I think it's paradoxical. So it is descriptive, but I do have analytical arguments. I have three arguments. The first is on the question of immigration versus citizenship. Is there a trade-off between the openness of borders and the inclusiveness of citizenship? This is an assumption that is made in almost all of the literature and especially in a classic position by Michael Walzer in the 1980s in his Spheres of Justice. He argues that you cannot have both open borders and inclusive citizenship and he says that because democracies need to be inclusive you need to close your borders. Otherwise, if borders are opened, then you would have to make your citizenship exclusive. I argue that there is no general trade-off between these two aspects. The second aspect is, uh, on the immigration side, we, what, uh, a puzzle which I frame as expats versus refugees. Right? We all know that we talk differently about different groups of immigrants. The expats are the high-skilled, the mobile, the wanted, and the refugees are maybe the unwanted and uh, not so skilled. and. Some sometimes framed as burdensome and uh, we want the expats but we don't want the refugees. And there's a lot of assumptions in the literature that uh, these uh, uh, reverse trends in opening and closing have been happening. I'm not going to deny that. I'm merely going to point out that in fact these policies towards refugees, labor migrants and family, reunification, uh, family migrants um, are actually positively correlated. So I also in a certain sense uh, say no to this question. Then on the citizenship side, uh, we have a, a strand of the literature that has debated, especially during the last decade, whether there has been a liberalization of citizenship or a restriction, uh, or, a li or a liberalization with some kind of restrictive turn uh, in other elements. Uh, now, I'm not going to uh, uh, debate or contest that this is the pattern that happened. Rather, I will point uh, out that those uh, states that are already pretty liberal with regard to certain citizenship policy components are also going to be uh, liberal with regard to civic integration, criminal record, economic requirements, which are part of this so-called restrictive term. So also here I say no. Um, this this tension doesn't exist as much as uh, one might assume. These three arguments boil down to one simple idea. Immigration policies and citizenship policies configure along two consistent and independent dimensions. Immigration policy openness is consistent. Citizenship policy inclusiveness is consistent. It's not multidimensional in itself. It's two consistent dimensions and the dimensions are to a large extent independent. That leads to what I call four different fruits of immigration. Now what do I mean by that? You can, <laughs> you can imagine, ideal typically speaking, that citizenship regimes are either exclusive or inclusive and immigration regimes are either closed or open. Now this is like fruits. If you Imagine a state being soft on the outside and soft on the inside, or soft on the outside and hard on the inside. The soft on both sides would be the blueberry, open inclusive. Soft and hard would be the peach, so that would be open borders, exclusive citizenship. Here we would have the Austrian almond, as you will see. <laughs> and then uh, here the, the watermelon, which is hard, soft. By the way, I was never sure about water, watermelon, whether it's hard enough outside. The uh, first term that was used to describe this uh, uh, was um, coconut, but it's not, the coconut is not really soft inside, it's, it's hollow, or it depends on the ripeness as well, right? So, 
Yeah, so if you, if you have better ideas, uh, please let me know. But this just as a, as a heuristic tool to uh, define these different ideal types. I hope it's a fruitful metaphor. Now, what am I going to do today? What are we going to drive through together? What kind of academic terrain? I will ex explain my take on the liberal paradox. It has different, many different interpretations and I will show why it is paradoxical. I will then specify the overarching notion of national boundary regimes regarding immigration. Regarding immigration is important because it could also be regarding emigration. We should not forget that. How this leads to the fruits of immigration typology. Then the three arguments that I've sketched at the beginning already. The data and methods that are then being used to shoot at these arguments to try to falsify them rather than saying confirm them. Um, then the three results on the lines uh, of the three arguments and some uh, uh, analysis beyond. Then some reflections on typologies and then the conclusion. So the liberal paradox, what does it mean? Uh, this idea was introduced by James Holyfield, a very well-known migration scholar from the US. Uh, and already in 1992, and then in an article in 2004, uh, he spoke of this paradox uh, in his the emerging migration state, he called it. The idea is that there is a tension between economic liberalism and political liberalism. Economic liberalism is in favor of territorial openness, especially for labor migrants, right? They want to have access to foreign labor. But political communities and democratic communities need a certain degree of territorial closure for, to contain certain risks that might be associated with immigration, real risks or perceived risks, and to protect the, uh, national, the integrity of the national community and to protect the social contract, which is the basis of democracy. So you see on the immigration dimension, there's this tension. But there's also a tension between openness towards labor migrants and then giving them inclusive rights once they enter. Because economic liberals or businesses, um, they would probably prefer openness, but maybe not too many rights to keep labor, labor costs low, right? So uh, there could be this kind of uh, trade-off as well. And to me, political liberalism is also uh, ingrained in inclusive rights. But Holyfield makes a different, uh, uses a different term because he says rights-based liberalism, which for me is the same as political liberalism, uh, but in an individualist sense, the political liberalism that I referred to above about integrity of national community, etc., is more kind of a collective kind of uh, liberalism. So he says, rights-based uh, liberalism is the solution. Then you can have both openness and uh, uh, inclusive rights. So he says that this is the solution and it actually he observes, he he claims that there's a gradual resolution of the liberal paradox, but then at the end of many of his uh, pieces, he says states will remain trapped in the liberal paradox for decades to come. This is paradoxical. First, the liberal paradox is solved by liberalism itself. So, I don't know whether it's such a strong paradox anymore, uh, uh, given that it's actually rights-based rights liberalism that can solve this tension. Maybe it's just a liberal nexus, but not a paradox in my eyes. And then the gradual resolu uh, resolution idea versus remaining trapped. Now, which one is it? Okay, um, now I take a step back and introduce my own conceptual framework and then we'll step by step come back to uh, how I think I can solve the paradox of the liberal paradox. Now, what I call national boundary regimes regarding um, immigration 
has two dimensions. This is a classical distinction made by Hamar and others, mostly by Hamar already in 85 and uh, uh, 1990, that talks about immigration policies and immigrant policies. So policies that concern the act of immigration crossing a border and policies that are concerned with immigrant integration. Now, I break these down uh, and I say the uh, immigration aspect, first and foremost, is composed of entry and stay. It's taken in a bit more because of the stay component, but also permit rights, what I would call permit rights. These are not voting rights that are based on like nationality criteria and things like this, but these are rights that are specifically tied to your entry permit. So they're part of this uh, first gate of admission of immigration. This is contested, uh, but I think it's, it's very useful to, to make this distinction. Permit rights, they vary across permits internationally. General rights vary cross-nationally and they don't vary across permits. That's so you have permit rights and then general rights, which usually we call integration policies, like voting rights, socioeconomic rights, access to the labor market, healthcare, uh, education, what have you. And then citizenship, which is, to me, the most crucial and core component of uh, an integration regime. Here, that's also Thomas Hammar's uh, uh, scheme of saying, okay, there's these three gates. And in my analysis, I will focus always on the first and the third gate. Of course, leaving out rights is leaving out a very important part. But this is just to reduce complexity. Because the difficult thing is already now to reduce this to two dimensions, because immigration policies are so complex. We will see this in a minute. And if I had three or four dimensions, I couldn't handle the problem anymore. And I think it's also theoretically and substantively interesting because citizenship is the key to so many things. It's also the key that permanently unlocks the first gate of entry. You have unconditional re-entry, uh, readmission rights. You, have, uh, you cannot be deported anymore. Um, so citizenship is a game changer. Now, these two dimensions, the immigration regime and the citizenship regimes, can be combined in different ways. And this leads to these different configurations that I've called the fruits of immigration. Now, only quickly, this is still work in progress. I would call this corner inclusive open cosmopolitanism. Uh, some of you might know uh, Joseph Kerens and his book, yeah? The Ethics of Immigration. That would be that position. Liberal nationalism would be maybe David Miller, who says we need very tightly controlled borders, but inclusive citizenship, although he would probably uh, demand things like language tests and stuff, so it's, it's not always um, so clear. He's uh, probably not as inclusive as a cosmopolitan on the citizenship side. Then this, I struggled a lot what to label this. I would label it neoliberalism. But this is only uh, with regard to labor migration. So open borders for labor migrants, but then no rights, no citizenship, exploitation. This is, to me, uh, this is neoliberalism. But I might have to rethink it because I'm also talking about family migrants and asylum seekers. And then this, I just call ethnic nationalism. I have no better term for that, and I think it fits. But yeah, please let me know what you think about this. I'm really interested in your ideas. So the first argument, the first big puzzle, do inclusive societies need closed borders? Is there a trade-off between immigration openness and citizenship uh, inclusiveness? You have this idea in much of the literature. The liberal paradox says that strong capitalist forces pressure governments of liberal states to open their borders to more labor migrants. Indeed, a country's economy uh, of an advanced capitalist state depends on labor migrant and on the uh, intelligent management of that labor migration. But then there could be a backlash or there should be some protections to keep the cohesion of the national community. So it actually predicts that once you open then citizenship would, becomes more exclusive, or if it already is exclusive, then it will not be liberalized. 
Then Michael Walzer, who I've already mentioned, would be the reverse liberal paradox that also starts from territorial closure, uh, starts not from territorial openness, but from territorial closure, and says that this, the control of borders, suggests the deepest meaning of national self-determination. And therefore, he thinks states should have discretion in who they want to admit and who they don't want to admit. If they can do that, then the people who are let in should be set on a path to citizenship. That is basically the, it ha the state has to have a filter and it has to be at the territorial border and then this person can be accepted as a future citizen. That's the, the function of the, terri uh, of the border regime. If borders were radically opened, he says that citizenship would become exclusive, and that's not good because that's actually tyranny of, from citizens over non-citizens. He calls it in his book tyranny, probably the most common form of tyranny he actually calls it in history. And then we would not anymore have a democratic state. So for him, it's really important to combine territorial clo closure and inclusive citizenship. The idea of the resolution of the liberal paradox, as suggested by... Um, James Holyfield, is that the terri territorial openness that is mainly in the economic dimension uh, is combined with rights-based liberalism. So we would have openness on the border and inclusive citizenship at the same time. And that's also, if I uh, should name another, I've named him before actually, yes, Joe Karens, that would be the cosmopolitan position. Now, in this whole field, there's a very good book by James Hampshire, which talks about um, four structural drivers of immigration and citizenship policies, mainly immigration. Uh, but it's, it's not very clear in his book. That's one of my critiques of his book. Anyway, the first one is that you have strong forces of capitalism and what Gary Freeman, one, of, uh, one migration scholar, uh, in the 90s called client politics, which is kind of an expansive dynamic towards labor migrants, uh, towards admitting more labor migrants, both high-skilled and low-skilled. So it's the demand, the, the imperatives from, from global open labor markets. Then another structural driver is the liberal constitutionalism and traditional politics in liberal states. So for example, uh, the entrenching of rights to family reunification is, by, uh, uh, is highlighted by certain authors as a key source for immigrant rights and for family reunification rights. Nationhood and national identity, which can be both exclusive or inclusive. That's what Hampshire doesn't really uh, uh, say. He says it always tends to the restrictive side, but we have... There are examples of countries that have a more inclusive national identity. Let's take Canada, for example. Um, I don't necessarily think that this, this has to be going in this direction. And electoral constraints, electoral competition, electoral politics. I add to this democratic legitimacy and stability, which also factors in, which is also a bit, uh, uh, a bit related to liberal constitutionalism but you will see what I mean by that. Now, you see that these different things can be, these different structural drivers can be combined differently to ye yield these different types that I was think speaking about. And illiberalism is also possible that would involve uh, territorial closure as maybe an exclusive national identity uh, takes over and uh, right-wing politics is uh, salient and exclusive citizenship at the same time and it would have the same drivers. So we come again to the fruits, back to the future. Not a good joke? Okay. <laughs> um, and now I filled it out with the different paradox, uh, the paradox boxes. Um, so the classical liberal paradox would be down here. Open, exclusive. The reversed one, Walzer's one, would be here. And the resolution would be here. And here is something that uh, Holyfield hasn't anticipated. 
So if we give up the idea that the liberal paradox always creates this tension and there's a general trade-off and uh, for a more nuanced perspective that these different things are possible in different states at different times, I think we gain a lot uh, analytical leverage. Now, expats refugees. We call the highly skilled expats. We call others refugees. Same structural drivers. Um, and the most important driver here and the most important form of immigration is labor migration. So capitalism and climate politics here uh, comes to the fore. That provides reasons for openness towards labor mi migrants, just as liberal constitutionalism and traditional politics provides uh, reasons for opening up to refugees, asylum seekers, but also uh, uh, family migrants. Nationhood and national identity can so either oppose these two other structural forces that are expansive in labor, in asylum seeking and family migration, or it can embrace it and uh, make it part of the national identity, like I say again, like Canada. Um, and what is even more important is that an identity, a national identity, has to be coherent to function as an identity. You can't just be, no, I'm a bit open, closed, and closed there. No, either you're open or you're closed. I, I mean, these are extremes, but an identity has to be coherent to be stable as a, as a social structure. So we can already guess that the openness towards the, this, these different groups of migrants might be one-dimensional because they're concerned with the same and they have complementary drivers of capitalism and liberal constitutionalism. Electoral politics, of course, intervenes and might make the uh, story more messy. And the democratic legitimacy and stability here is in the background. It's not as important as for citizenship, as we will see. But on the whole, based on these ideas, which are still so, somewhat catchy, I think, uh, sketchy, I think, uh, I argue that immigration receipts are consistent and overall have a liberalizing thrust because more of the structural drivers actually go into the liberalizing direction. So liberalization versus restriction now to citizenship. In the literature, um, three main elements have been discussed that have been almost, well, not almost everywhere, I shouldn't say this. <laughs> Switzerland, Austria, <laughs> no. But there has been a broad tendency uh, uh, in liberalizing, especially the residence requirements, so shortening residence requirements, tolerating multiple citizenship, and granting citizenship by birth on the territory, use solely. At the same time, there have been restrictive turns with the introduction of language and citizenship tests and with criminal record and economic conditions. And the story has always been in this literature that, well, there's this liberalizing tendency and now there's a restrictive turn. What is it now? Uh, uh, is it now going that way or the other way? And a lot have argued that this broad liberalizing tendency, uh, the, the restrictive turn is actually embedded in this broad liberalizing tendency. And I go even further and I argue that states that are liberal to start with also don't uh, introduce um, uh, stricter language and uh, citizenship tests, etc. Because uh, citizenship policies are more than anything else connected to nationhood and national identity. I think that's the main structural driver behind uh, citizenship policies. And there again, uh, it's, a, it's a question of coherence, whether the identity as a societal structure is, uh, is stable and is coherent. It has to be coherent to be stable, that is. But I think here electoral politics come very early because it's a very contested arena and uh, very symbolic as well. But also democratic legitimacy concerns uh, come to the fore. Uh, they can provide reasons for uh, liberalizing the access to citizenship for immigrants, mostly. And also liberal constitutionalism has the same thrust 
And capitalism and climate politics, I'm not quite sure if you want to uh, speak about the evil uh, big companies uh, that are neoliberal and exploiting everyone, uh, then maybe we would say they uh, don't want uh, uh, migrants to have citizenship. But b business elites have also been said to uh, uh, pressure for more inclusive citizenship regimes because for them then actually the, the worker has a more secu secure situation. It's also an investment a human resources investment, right? So, but in any case, capitalism here is way back on the agenda. So nationhood is at the fore, electoral politics, democratic legitimacy. So you can see these different structural drivers very differently. And in the immigration realm, we mainly have economic and political uh, considerations. And in the citizenship realms, we get into cultural considerations as well. So these are really divergent structural forces that should uh, lead us to expect that the two are independent. So here also citizenship regimes are consistent and have a liberalizing thrust. And now the three arguments summed up. Very simple. Consistent, consistent, independent. Oh, this is boring. Okay. Make it more interesting again. Data, measurements, concept specification. Immigration regime openness, what does that mean? I focus on three ordinary groups of, migration, uh, of migrants. The three most common. Labor immigration, family reunification, and asylum seekers and refugees. There are other data sets that include students, uh, or there's also some items on illegals, um, in some indices, I concentrate on these. And there's also actually, interestingly, on co-ethnics. So uh, the data I'm going to use is also interesting from an emigrant perspective. And I look at conditions for entry for these groups, and I look at conditions for stay. Oops. Okay. The data comes from the Immigration Policies and Comparison Project, which is a fairly new data set um, uh, compiled by Mark Helbling and his team at the WZB in uh, Berlin. Citizenship regime inclusiveness, I include residence duration, toleration of multiple citizenships, strength of use solely, and the further naturalization conditions that I mentioned. And I have called this uh, index the Citrix. It's kind of common in this literature of migration and citizenship to have new names for new indices. I've also uh, published an IMIX, an Immigrant Inclusion Index. And there, there's Civix, and there's ICRI, and there's IMPIC, and <laughs> Citrix. Sounds cool. Anyway, this is stupid marketing. What it really is based on is an expansion of MyPEX and the data by uh, Yeremias, who made it much, much easier and much, much faster. So I cover 23 democracies from 1980 to 2010. That's the EU15 plus Switzerland, Norway, and Iceland. Yeah, Iceland is also here, not only at the World Cup. <laughs> Four settler states, uh, US, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and Japan. And together, that gives us 713 country years. And yeah, the method. Sounds maybe a bit uh, 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 cryptic. Categorical principle component analysis. This is nothing else than kind of a simultaneous correlation check or correlation analysis that tells you whether your data can be reduced to one or two or to a few dimensions. And so you, you will see when, when you see the table. It, it's actually quite intuitive, I think. Is that intuitive? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'll try to explain. So up here I have the in-pick variables, labor, family, asylum, both entry and stay. And here the um, citizenship variables. And what we see here, I put in bold all the component loadings, as they're called, um, that are uh, above 0.5. So 
these correlate together, these items form a consistent dimension. They're low on the second dimension, but on the second dimension, there are these citizenship uh, uh, indicators. So th this is consistent, this is consistent, and they are independent. But I use a rotation technique. So uh, principal component analysis calculates a solution for components, and then you have to rotate that solution. It would be I don't know if I could explain that, what that actually means, but the idea is that each uh, item will get a score as high as possible on one dimension and as low as possible on the other, to have discrimination. But the Vadimax rotation has a built-in assumption that the two are independent. So this is given. So I ran also an analysis with Promax rotation, which is a very useful one if you want to estimate at the same time to what extent the dimensions are correlated. So it leaves the data that freedom and it's correlated at minus 0.15. So it's a very, very weak um, negative correlation, which warrants uh, body max to, to have it simpler. Now, of course, I can't take just these component scores and analyze the relationship between the two because by the very mean of Vardimax, I, uh, I have imposed independence on the data. So what I do is I just take the arithmetic mean of here the immigration regime openness, but that variable is not very nice, is it? It's, it's uh, left skewed and... Yeah, what to do? Square it. Looks nicer. I mean, the problem is, this is ordinal data. So, this and this is actually the same thing. The ranks are preserved. I do this, nah, I do this to get a better distribution that better approximates normality that then can be used in regression analysis. Squaring it um, makes it a bit more like a linear construct. It better approximates uh, the linear construct. I really hope that this, uh, that reviewers will, um, will eat this. <laughs> um, so now, have a look. <laughs> so some notable, notable examples. Um, the immigration regime was actually liberalized in Austria. We're going to talk about that afterwards because uh, it's really weird. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the people you love to hate. <laughs> um, and here also we have the. This is the 2005 uh, citizenship reform here. The the, uh, the restrictive term. Overall, you see that these things don't vary that much. Um, immigration policies vary, uh, vary more, but citizenship policies sometimes stay the same all over Canada as well. Uh, in Ireland, this is the conditional use solely, but it's basically it's, it's the same. Um, and this points to the strong path dependency of, of the policies and that these are really uh, yeah, slow-moving uh, uh, policy areas, which makes it kind of hard to, um, to analyze with panel regressions. But that there, there are ways, I hope so, and I'm trying to do it. Um, now, the mean values across the whole sample, we see that integration regime openness has been liberalized. Here, a little curious T restrictive turn right after 2001, but overall it's, uh, it's a liberalization. Uh, in citizenship also a liberalization, but that's the restrictive turn that the literature is talking about. Civic integration tests, economic and criminal record requirements were mostly introduced at that time. Now, this is how it looks when we plot it in two-dimensional space. The first thing I want to tell you is that here, there's nothing. Um, that has to do with the squaring, but that also shows that 
very, very open borders are just uncommon. And of course, even if they scored one on the indicator here, they wouldn't be the open borders that Joe Kerens is talking about. We're in the real world. So, but still, if you, when I say blueberry regimes, this is very relative. So actually, as you see here, the majority of cases are blueberry regimes. But now, wait, OK, how do I categorize them? That's the crucial question. For citizenship regime inclusiveness, I think it makes sense to use 50 because the indicators are coded in a way of 0, 50, 100. Like bad or like just very restrictive. Oh, just gave him a, away my preference. Um, <laughs> which is what MIPEX actually does. It's, it's not uh, normatively neutral, which is problematic. Um, so most restrictive medium and most liberal. Three, uh, so zero, 50, 100. And only a few indicators don't follow. So I have one four point indicator that I've um, changed, but also on that is 33, uh, 67. So 50 is kind of a natural <coughs> threshold, but it's just, it's more in a relative sense, I would say. Now, the immigration regime openness was very, very hard to find a, a threshold. And I actually will argue that it's impossible to actually define a threshold. Uh, because I chose 40 because the arithmetic mean is very near 40. So this is just a relative sense uh, uh, typology. And, and even at that, when you look at this dot and this dot, I don't think there is a qualitative difference there on this dimension. One would have to go differently about this concept specification to really say, okay, is, is something a member of that, of that type that would be more kind of a logic of necessary and sufficient conditions, set theoretic thinking, to say, okay, maybe some use solely as necessary, uh, residence duration requirement uh, below five uh, uh, is necessary, and so on. And you see, I do this with the citizenship because it's much uh, easier. Doing this with the immigration, with all these indicators, is impossible. So this will always be arbitrary, and I just chose the arithmetic mean, which makes it a relativistic typology. And interestingly here, we see that actually uh, the two are positively correlated. So not that much, but still. And this is the development in the two-dimensional space. I should have made uh, years, but to see what happens. That's the start again. Yeah, also something I want to do is also plot uh, regression lines for each one. Then you can always see, I can already tell you that in 1980 it's negative and in 2010 it's positive. So, and uh, also other analysis show that actually over time the relationship becomes more positive, which is going to be one of my main arguments uh, in the other paper. Yeah. Now, let's go to Austria and let's uh, talk about that, uh, that difficulty. So in immigration regime openness, just because it is here, does that mean it's open? And also the policy indicators I use uh, indicate that there have been immigration uh, uh, regime liberalizations which is what I not at all find in the literature and in the, in the newspapers and everything. And I'm actually, I will contact uh, the expert who coded this. But this can just also show us a very interesting thing that what you think subjectively, even how lawyers uh, or part politicians and lawyers writing the laws think, may not be the same as a scientist would score it on some certain indicator. And part of this liberalization that we see here was because of implementation of EU directives. 
that's also a, a certain story that you actually see, especially in family unification. There was liberalization uh, due to EU, EU rules. Yeah, but uh, so I would say Austria is an element, and with the uh, current uh, situation, it may be an almondizing almond. <laughs> I want to take a quick tea to some reflections. Uh, I guess most of you are familiar with this. This typology from Koopmans et al., uh, which in the early 2000s, it only had these four different things, and then there was... Um, this was assimilationism, multiculturalism, segregationism, universalism. And they categorized countries into these types. They didn't have these quantitative indicators like they do now, but they had really a, a typology where categorically you would classify cases. Now this has changed. It goes more and more to a difference in degree and not difference in type anymore. This is the trend, and this model based comparative uh, uh, citizenship work has been, uh, uh, how to say, uh, has been rejected uh, by most scholars now. Uh, it may still be a heuristic tool. I also think it's a good heuristic tool to have these ideal types in mind. But this over-idealization and uh, uh, characterization of cases as just this is this model or that model, Policies are much more complex, and uh, also my typology vastly reduces uh, the complexity that is in, in these laws. Now, the difference between Koopmans and others is that Koopmans has not um, tested this dimensionality. In my paper, I test the dimensionality with principal component analysis. There's another example from Bauböck and Wink. that use principal component analysis to uh, uh, test their citizenship configuration typology. And they find these two dimensions, and here it's very interesting. Here we finally go away from the immigration, immigrant uh, uh, receiving country focus to a more comprehensive perspective on citizenship regimes, which not only uh, imply uh, acquisition of citizenship, but also loss of citizenship and uh, various other elements. And they can show that there are two different dimensions, territorial inclusion and ethnocultural inclusion, whereas the ethnocultural inclusion relates mostly to immigrants, not only, but mostly, and territorial inclusion mostly to immigrants, but also not only. Here, they do not categorize the cases. And I think I also should not categorize the cases. Oh. My time's over. Can I? Yeah, please. Okay, good. <laughs> Still awake? <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I also think that in my analysis, I mean, when I go back to this, what should I do with this? Um, so if I'm interested in the relationship between immigration policy openness and citizenship policy openness, we can look at the correlation between the two. But another approach would be really to... Cut. Did you? Oh, okay. You can ask questions. <laughs> so, um, you would have to categorize the cases, and then um, you would have to explain why one case is in that category or in the other category. I don't think this is a good approach, because first of all, it's always arbitrary where you do your cutoff point. And it reduces so much variation when you just categorize, uh, I mean, this case up here is not the same as this case down here. So, And then, if you have two dimensions, you're trying to explain variation in two dimensions at the same time, which to me doesn't make sense. There are different typologies that are not so much about mapping empirical variation on continuous scales, but like types of democracy that Leipart, for example, in the early days of Leipart, before he had his consensus democracy or majoritarian democracy, that said, well, there are different types. That I think it was cooperation of elites or yeah, elite cooperation, elite competition, and another dimension. Then he would say, 
Well, this gives four possible types that kind of complement each other to uh, create a functional whole. And only this works, only this and this combination works. So he actually said only two types actually are stable. It's about the functioning of the system. All these this system function, uh, more or less, however you define functioning and stability, but it's not empirically impossible to have a different configuration. So this is a different approach to typologies. That's why I think uh, I should further explore the, the, the relationships of variables, um, uh, of these two variables. Um, to sum up, we have this two-dimensional space, which we can be um, reduced or simplified into in these uh, four boxes. I don't need to repeat this anymore, just a general message again. The liberal paradox is a general idea. Simplify things far as too much. We need to uh, broaden our horizon and see how it plays out uh, uh, in different contexts and how actually these different configurations are already ingrained in the original idea of the liberal paradox. And by doing so, we can resolve the paradoxical aspects of the liberal paradox. And if we just focus on two-dimensional spaces, if we don't take it as a typology but as a just two-dimensional space, then I think you can still say something about uh, similarity with types. So I would imagine that for, this is completely, uh, the data is real, but the lines are not. This is... Uh, but they still can see. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but the, there may be wishful thinking of, I uh, would be nicer. So you could argue that when borders are opened, uh, under left-wing uh, governments, then citizenship is also liberalized. So here, that corner would be explained by uh, open borders and a strong left-wing power. Then here would be closed borders, uh, not strong, but also strong left-wing power. So it would be this. Or then you could say if borders are open and right-wing politicians are strong, they will, uh, uh, it will go to exclusive side and you can still say something about the conditions to go to that corner and the condition to go to that area. So I think you can, uh, uh, if you work with interactions, you can still kind of, in another way, think about what conditions give rise to uh, different configurations. I hope. This is what I'm trying to do. Thanks. Well, thank you.